Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to the May meeting of Health InfoNet's Behavioral Health Information Technology Reimbursement Initiative. Thank you for participating today. I am Gemma, as you know, and I am the chairperson for this call. I am the Behavioral Health Program Coordinator at Health InfoNet. And before we get started, we do want to do just a couple of housekeeping items, and then we're going to review the agenda for today's meeting. So, as always, we have muted the call so that we don't have background noise. We will be doing a Q&A after the meeting is over. Uh, you can, however, throughout the meeting, use the chat feature in the corner lower left to, um, to put in your questions, and we will get to you when we can. So today, we are really privileged to be joined by Kara Sear, who is the Substance Abuse Provider at AMHC, and we also have with us the team at Tri-County. Um, first, Kara is going to let us know a little bit about how she uses Health Internet as a Substance Abuse Provider. When I um, had an opportunity to speak with Kara the other day, I really wanted her to get on the line today to share with you how she uses the portal because it might be helpful for your providers who are in this arena as well. So really privileged to have Kara with us today. We're also joined by Tri-County's team and we have Peggy Newton and Kathy Beckwith who will begin the Tri-County portion of our, of our meeting today. And they have a lot to share with us about their rollout of the behavioral health home program in, across their agency, and they have some ways of really setting it up and systemizing this that I think might be helpful strategies for some of you on the call, especially as you're rolling out your behavioral health homes, to look at and consider that might be helpful for you as well. And um, fingers crossed that Jennifer Parent, who is so talented and gifted, a nurse, a psychiatric nurse practitioner. We have her scheduled. I did not hear her in the call. Sometimes when we have providers who are seeing clients live, as we all know, crises can come up and that may have kept her away from us. If that is the case, I will really try to get her back for next, next month's um, meeting. She's, she has so much to share with us. So hopeful we'll, we'll have Jennifer today, but if not, um, we're so pleased to have Kara, Peggy, and Kathy joining us. And after we hear from our presenters today, uh, Katie is going to talk about the Keepro project, and, um, and I will just give some updates. And then we'll have some Q&As. And um, please, again, don't hesitate to use the chat for that. So um, we're going to move ahead to um, begin with Kara. And um, as I was mentioning, um, Kara has some really interesting ways that other providers, I, I really, it was new to me to hear her tell how she uses the portal. So with that, I'm just going to stop talking and give it to Kara, the expert. So Kara, if you could um, take it from here. Thank you, Gemma. Um, I run a Suboxone clinic in Aroostook County, northern Aroostook County. And we rolled out Health InfoNet last year, and all clients who come into the clinic can either opt in or opt out. Um, I prefer that they opt in, and I'll talk about that afterwards. But basically what I use it for, um, if they haven't been to a doctor in the period of time, this can help me link them to their previous providers, or give me more information for those who do have doctors, like if they go um, for a physical or they have medical stuff going on. It also helps me in terms of if a client goes to the emergency room instead of going to their doctor, we can talk about why. It shows me what they're being prescribed. And if they go, let's say they go to the ER looking for opiates, when they're on Suboxone, they cannot be taking opiates. So this can help me weed out um, any med-seeking behaviors, any issues on that front that I can help them work through. It also helps me see what they are being prescribed by everybody. And then I can either work with them and their provider or just them, whichever they choose, on why they're being prescribed that may be something different. It's really tricky when clients are being prescribed benzos and suboxone in conjunction with each other because that's not a good mix. 
So that helps on that front. And I definitely, like I said, I definitely use the Health InfoNet as integrated part of my clinical work with them. The next slide, Gemma. <laughs> Sorry, I'm bouncing all over the place. Um, again, like I said, going to the ED, that's a very, very, very big one because for a lot of our main care clients, there was a big push to get them to discontinue using the emergency department unless it was a life-threatening medical issue. If they could wait to go to their primary care, we prefer to work with them to do that rather than go to the ER. When a client opts out of Health InfoNet, um, given my role as a substance abuse counselor, that for me often raises red flags. Um, why are you opting out? Is there a particular reason? Is there something you don't want me to see? Something you don't want me to know? Um, and then at that point I really drill home how me being able to have access to that can help me with the continuum of care. Since we're moving towards more integrated approaches, combining mental health, substance abuse, behavioral health, medical all together, this really helps. And I can kind of discuss that with them. But we do have some who just aren't in it, don't want to be in it. And that's fine. That is their right. That is their decision. But it definitely, I definitely do not stop having the conversation just because it, it does help. You know, it does help to all be on the same page and to know what each person is up to, what they might need, what they might be missing, those types of situations. Um, next slide, Gemma. Thank you. When it first came out and I was first approached by our quality department with Health InfoNet, I was really like, ugh. I felt like they do in the beginning as far as their privacy. It made me feel like they didn't have anything separate from me. But then once I got on the system and got to see what I can and can't do and what it does show me and how it can help me and help them ultimately, it's, it's really great. It's a really great tool because it makes, puts me in a position to be able to help them with all of their needs. Because a lot of our clients do not have health insurance, so they do not have access to other services like community integration, behavioral health, home, therapy. So this really helps me to be able to be the case manager type role for them. And it puts me in a better position to be able to link them to other services that they need that they might not even know are available. So overall, um, Health InfoNet has definitely helped me be able to more effectively run the clinic, more effectively address individual needs, be able to help them in the moment more than if I didn't have access to it. I believe that's it for me, Gemma. I was I had muted myself, so there I am talking like a like a funny person out to the air. <laughs> so is there is there any story that you want to tell us about how Health InfoNet um, really made a difference with one particular client? <laughs> I knew that one was coming. I had an individual just recently actually who he's not in the clinic, but he was working with me for deep and all of a sudden, he started having these situations happen where it looked like he was overdosing, but his screens were clear. He'd show up in the, the ER in an altered mental state was always what they marked it as. And it just nothing that he was saying to me about these situations was adding up. But because I had access to Health InfoNet and because he's enrolled, I was able to pull up all the ER reports, all the drug screens, all the clinical recommendations from the doctors, and really be able to pinpoint what they believed had happened, what happened while he was in the hospital, recommendations they made going forward. And then I was able to work more closely with his primary care to nail down what we should be doing to help him going forward. But without Health InfoNet, I would not have known any of that. I just would have known he had been in the hospital and then I would have had to hunt down all these records from 
the hospital themselves, which as we all know is very easy to do. So it is. It has been a real time saver for you, as well as has been really helpful in providing treatment to the clients. Oh, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Kara, for taking the time to um, to share all of this with us, and um, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on to um, our tri county portion of the of our webinar with Peggy and Kathy. We're going to get started, and. Um, we're going to have them tell us their story of the behavioral health home rollout and how they expanded the usage of health infonet across the agency. So um, you can see a story in the data, and in this data, I think it's really quite telling that in a six-month period, Tri-County um, actually increased the rate of health infonet lookups by five times. Now, that's 500 a month they average. That's 500 client records that they're going into and making a difference. That was pretty, pretty um, amazing. And I, and I wanted to know, well, you know, there's cause and effect involved, clearly. What happened that made those numbers change so much? So I got on the phone with Peggy, and I asked her what happened. And this is what she told me. They um, rolled out behavioral health homes across the agency. And um, so I asked her to, to tell me more. How did you do it? What was your secret? Because you did this so comprehensively. Um, give, us, give us the secret sauce. And Peggy, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you so that you can tell us your story on how you rolled this out so effectively. Oh, okay. Thank you, Gemma. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Okay. Um, prior to 2016, uh, we used HIN a little bit with um, our ACT program, and our medical providers were uh, using uh, the exchange. When we first implemented the behavioral health home um, in 2014, we had some slight increase at our Bartlett Street location, but I think initially for us, um, there were some uh, frustrations with being able to access the portal, and lots of providers um, at that time weren't putting information in. So uh, like our nurse on the ACT team uh, would describe going in to get labs, and uh, the particular um, lab or hospital wasn't entering uh, the information in yet. So he got frustrated pretty quick and just decided he's going to call the PCP and get that. Uh, but that was um, that was way back in um, 2012 through 2014 when we were first using um, HIN, and uh, we have come so far. Uh, so really, I think what happened for us um, in G January through March. I think my maybe I'm on a different slide now, Gemma. Nope. January through March. Um, um, our leadership um, really had uh, believed in the behavioral health model. Uh, we had uh, really uh, good results uh, with what was going on in our program at the Bartlett Street location. And so we decided that we were going to roll this out um, across all four other locations. Not just adult, but adult and child. So for the children's uh, behavioral health home, it was actually it was five locations. Um, and then I think I'm trying to follow the slides. I guess we can go to the next slide. Okay. So we anyway we had a, um, a leadership that believed in support of the EHH model, um, as well as supporting uh, the use of the health information exchange um, in order to enhance um, our work with consumers and coordinate care. And I think also uh, we began working uh, more closely with um, health home practices. Um, we started out doing, um, initially when we were going to roll this out, we started out doing some uh, consent education with uh, the senior leadership, and that began in 2015. Um, we did uh, PowerPoint training that we sent up and. Uh, thankfully, you reviewed that for us and gave us some feedback on that. We still use that PowerPoint uh, to this day to train. 
so we took the PowerPoint, Kathy and I, and we went out to um, all of our locations, and uh, we required that staff um, uh, attend. So we did make it mandatory. And when they were unable to attend, what would happen is the supervisors would pick that training up. And a lot of times if we bring on a new nurse practitioner or um, a team lead, uh, it could be that they come through uh, terrain, training directly with Kathy Beckwith, who is our uh, performance and quality improvement coordinator. So I think I'm on to the next slide. Okay, so when, um, when our use of um, the Health Infinite Exchange really took off, um, it was um, when, after we began uh, working on the uh, QI project. Um, and we really started recognizing some of the benefits of use. And initially, uh, like I had said earlier, it was the Ag Team and uh, the Behavioral Health Home at our uh, Bartlett Street location. Um, and in working with you, Gemma, we were able to set up um, some panels of high-risk consumers that were provided to us. And these were consumers that um, had um, a certain number of ED visits and uh, were presenting at the hospital and having um, um, admissions and reoccurring mission admissions. Um, and when staff started foreseeing that by setting up these panels that they were able to receive notifications when consumers did present to the ED, they got really excited about that because a lot of times they could go over and interface with the consumer um, in real time, particularly at our uh, Lewiston location because we got two hospitals uh, really close by. So that was, um, that was a, a significant improvement. And that um, benefit that they saw we were able to share with um, our other providers in our behavioral health home across the agency. And it was, it, the thing that I think is, is interesting now is that I'll have uh, staff uh, come by and uh, we have our initial panel for, um, for the QI project. Um, I think it's probably down to about 30 consumers now. But I'm having staff come up and ask me if they can add their whole uh, caseload list on panels. Now, and that's, that's a complete change uh, from anything that uh, was going on before. So uh, that's, that's been an improvement. And I think it speaks to the more people are using it and seeing the benefits of it. Um, it's, um, it's just people are using it more. I think we're on to the next. Um, Next slide. Okay, so uh, in thinking about rolling this out, we worked with IT to make sure that um, um, staff were able to have access because we didn't want providers to get really frustrated when they couldn't sign into the portal. And, uh, and sometimes, I mean, on our end, we'd have to go in and we'd have to unrestrict the sites, unrestrict the sites that we were trying to access. And then other times we would call um, HIN help desk and get support for uh, getting in because we really wanted to um, improve that process so that that access would not be a barrier and there's significant improvement in that. Um, and then we're on to the next slide. So we did change our uh, notice of uh, privacy practice and this was really to ensure that we were compliant with uh, main state law around education to consumers about um, health info net uh, and, the, and the exchange, um, about their choices, um, and offering them uh, opt-in for sharing uh, mental health or, and or HIV information, and also opt-out forms. Um, so yeah, we can go. Oh, I, I wanted to tell you also, Gemma, because we had talked about it on our call, about the additional thing that we added into our rights of recipients. So we wrote in right to choose participation in Health Info Net. Um, and we said, you have a right to choose if you want to want your mental health and or HIV information to be shared in your Health uh, Info Net record. You may choose to share your information, your medical information only. 
You may choose to share your mental health information, HIV information, or both. You may choose to share your mental health information, HIV information, or both with an individual provider, or you may choose to remove all your medical information from uh, Health InfoNet. So we, had, we added that in there, and then on the signature page, uh, we have a, a checkbox that they check that by signing they acknowledge that they have been given um, our notice of privacy practice and, and also explained uh, their rights to choose participation in um, uh, the health, um, health info now. So I, I wanted to stop you right there, Peggy, because I think this is such a great idea you guys came up with to have one piece of paper that you already have a piece of paper that has a checkbox saying that um, they received the right to recipients education. You're using that same piece of paper with just another checkbox saying they also received education about health info net. Yes, yeah, and, it, and it, it, it isn't like we had to do a different form or anything. We just had to tweak the form that we had. Um, and consumers are used to um, re-signing that annually anyway. Um, so the other thing that we did with that um, is um, we decided that we were going to audit to make sure that um, all consumers had been educated um, and were given the new rights of recipients. And so we audited um, all of the records across the agency. And then when uh, we see that there's a, a consumer signature there, it kind of confirms that they've received the education. And when we don't find a new um, updated rights of recipients in there, we notify the provider and the supervisor. So in preparation for this um, agency-wide rollout, we, we had you know uh, those couple of things that we had to uh, update. And also, uh, we sent those out for uh, our attorneys to review and to approve. Um, and so all was good with that, but it was quite a process. And then getting everything to the printer, and then getting it out to the locations. But it's, it's just, it's automatic now, so that uh, heavy lifting is over. So I think I'm on to the next slide. Okay, so this slide speaks to um, that we decided to roll out the HI consent education training believe this or not, at the same time we rolled out the behavioral health model um, across all of our program sites. Uh, and that's when we really jumped to the 60 users. And that was between uh, January and March of uh, 2016. And uh, we can, I think we can go to the next slide now. Okay. And one of the things that um, came to mind for us is this, like, is this too much or what are we thinking uh, doing this um, all together? Uh, but the only thing that I can say now and, and everything is that it, it really worked and I probably wouldn't do it um, any other way. Um, while we were going in, a lot of the program managers and the clinical supervisors were talking about the BHH model and um, Kathy and I from QM would go in and follow up and talk about the benefits of uh, using the health information exchange. And we also had the experience of um, the behavioral health home uh, at our Bartlett Street location getting the HIN notifications and how they were using that because they were part of the, the QI uh, project. So we had a little bit of, uh, you know, benefits and positive things to kind of share with um, the, uh, the locations when they were rolling out um, the new health home. So it really helps to sort of have internal discussions. You had people who everyone knew in the organization and trusted saying that it was an okay thing to do. Yes. When, when we did go to locations, and we did run into this a few times, um, at one particular location, there was a lot of negativity uh, and concern around using um, HIN and um, you know the issues around uh, privacy. Uh, what we did is we went, we gave them a week or so to think about that, <laughs> and the supervisor met with them and talked with them, and we went back and we did training again. 
Um, and what we what we did learn and what we asked folks to do, sometimes um, providers would come to us and say, well, I'm just not comfortable doing that. Um, and um, so we, we process with people, well, if you're not comfortable with that um, and you're not thinking it's a good idea, um, do you think that might influence how you talk with consumers about it? And they said, oh, definitely. Um, so we thank them for sharing that. And what we did is we offered them an opportunity to have someone else have those types of discussions. So that might be um, um, an operations staff or the clinical supervisor doing it. When we initially uh, rolled out um, the um, consent training across the agency, um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> we involved. Um, Oh, we, what we did is we involved the p providers. So for all of our active consumers that were already in services, their primary providers were the ones that had the, uh, that provided the HIN um, consumer education training. And for new consumers coming in and being admitted, that happened with our customer service reps when they were doing intakes and registrations and things like that. And they got very, very comfortable with that. Um, they all have um, printed um, laminated copies of uh, Health InfoNet Your Choices with scripts on the back. So they're really prepared to, to uh, have those discussions. So that's kind of how we, um, we dealt with that. Um, and I think initially that staff were um, um, concerned, and I think as we got more into it, uh, staff were more comfortable when they really understood that um, the information isn't viewable unless they um, give um, uh, consent for sharing that information. Um, and I think the majority of the consumers in our agency um, mostly did nothing. I don't think we had maybe more than 20, 30 consumers that um, opted out and maybe that many that said, oh, I want it to be viewable and I want to share my information. Most of them, it was just, it was just um, they didn't do anything and they're going to wait and have those discussions at any point in care that they choose to. Does that make sense? It, it does. It does. And you are pointing out that there's a difference between an initial rollout with um, almost all providers hands on deck doing something that in the long term they won't need to be doing. Well, one right. of the things that, that um, maybe will come up um, later is that often the nurse care managers do talk with people about Health InfoNet, or like Kara was saying in her meetings, um, you know, she uses this, talks about Health InfoNet in terms of, you know, clinical treatment. So that's another time when it can be um, re-entered. But um, maybe we can move on. I, I just want to look at this next slide. I think it's really terrific to see um, how different it is from a year ago. And if you could talk a little bit about what your current best practice is um, for maintaining this level of involvement. Yeah. A, a lot of what's happening is that the nurse managers are uh, doing a lot of the lookups in, in the um, exchange and they're coming back and reporting that out to the teams. Um, our team meetings are uh, for an hour, three times a week. I think in our Lewiston location, it's Monday, Wednesdays, Fridays. Not sure what it is in the other locations, but I'm pretty sure that they're all doing uh, three times a week. Um, the thing I, I guess that I've noticed is that the discussions around using the portal and uh, getting that medical information is just really built right into team discussions now. So it's just like standard practice. Um, I can't think of um, a team meeting that you would go to that you wouldn't hear some uh, reference to the use of um, uh, Health InfoNet. Yeah, and as you, as you said, that's new this year. It is new this year. There's I think the nurse care managers uh, really made a, a big difference in that. And I think they also uh, take really seriously um, identifying and tracking, uh, you know, metrics that, um, that we're starting to look at. So it's, 
it's it's been really great. That's just terrific. I, another thing I really want you to talk about, because I, I don't see other organizations leveraging the Health Infonet Academy the way that you do. Could you share a little, no, I, I think it's just marvelous that you're able to train people using the Academy, and, and it's, it's available to everyone here on the call, just in case it might be helpful for them. Can you talk a little bit about how this has worked for you? Yes, we love the, the um, HIN Academy. What we decided to, to do, um, we couldn't really build uh, that in, in uh, going and navigating the portal into our regular orientation. When we initially were trained to, to navigate in the portal, um, it was Susan, was it Susan that came down and uh, trained us, Susan Bear? Sharon. Sharon, okay. Um, and that was uh, quite a while ago, but we started using um, the Academy. So we have all staff now that request access to um, the HIN portal. They have to go through the Training Academy and then they, they go through our um, EHR administrator. So they have to complete consent training. That can either be with their supervisor or it can be with um, Kathy Beckwith. Um, they do the academy uh, training, and once that's done, our EHR administrator contacts HIN, and then they're given access. And it's working very, very well. People know the procedure. It's the routine. Um, that's how we get it done. It's, it's, we like it. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, it's per ter perfect. Thank you, Peggy. And um, the leadership, tell, talk a little bit about, uh, just to close, on the behavioral health home model and, um, and what that's meant for you with health home. Well, I mean, I, I think um, the, the leadership really um, supports the uh, BHH model and really believes uh, the organization's uh, use of the health information exchange really enhances that model. Um, and it's just, we just automatically implement that now uh, when we do um, anything with behavioral health homes. It's just, it's just really critical. And I don't think that's something that you can start at the provider level or even at the mid-management uh, level. I think uh, you have to have strong, uh, senior leadership and executive teams that sort of um, support that direction that you're going in and, you know, allowing time for um, staff training and opportunities to talk about the benefits of it. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you so much, and, and Kathy, for being in the background there. The, um, I, I think a real great takeaway is the detail you've given to, to putting this systemically through your organization so that training is part of it and it's ongoing. When you're seeing an issue, you go back in and you go deeper, you do more training, you keep um, the avenues open, you listen to them, you give them what they need. I think um, that's part of the secret sauce. So good job to you, both of you on the line representing Tri-County today. Um, thank you, you've, you've offered a lot to us today. Thank you. And um, we're, we're gonna move on to um, another Tri-County staff member, but first I'm gonna do a call out to see if, if Jen has been able to um, leave your, your patients for a few minutes and join us today. Jen, are you on the line? If you are, you have to press star seven to unmute you so that I can hear you. Are you there? Star seven for Jennifer Parent. Well, I'm not hearing Jennifer on the line. I, she has so much to say. I really will see if she can come back and join us in June and hopefully um, an emergency won't keep her away from us. The crisis that happens in our behavioral health organizations happen in real time, so we understand that. So what we're gonna do is move ahead, excuse me while I do some um, real fine here. That's I'm gonna find, we're gonna go to Katie. Um, but there was some great stuff. I'm looking through these slides and I'm just salivating, waiting to hear from Jennifer. So next time, everyone, we will talk to Jennifer. Um, and I am going to keep moving and I'm gonna hand this over to Katie. Okay, well, I'm certainly not as exciting as Jennifer's presentation, um, but good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, I, we have been rolling out um, through different communication channels our new data set that Main Care is now providing via a direct connection that Health InfoNet has with uh, Keepro, the prior authorization, et cetera, vendor that you all know very well. Um, so I don't need to orient you to what Keepro is, like I've had to do with some other folks um, who are not familiar. Um, so I just have a few slides that I wanted to use the opportunity that we have with you today to just review some information that we've put out through other venue, uh, venues. So we've held um, one previous very brief webinar which um, has been recorded and we can make sure that everyone has the link to that. I know Gemma's already on top of that, um, where I reviewed this information as well. So if there's others that need um, any information about this, we can get it out there and share it. Um, so just a little bit about the background to this information for folks that may be unaware um, is that, um, so as I have said, we're getting, we're calling this data prior authorization data. You all folks that work in the field know that it can be more than that. It can be registration, certification type of information. So we're using the term prior authorization because it's what um, is easiest to communicate um, with all users of the Health InfoNet portal. Um, and the data that we're receiving from Keepro is updated on a daily basis. This data at this time is in an initial pilot phase and it is only available for patients that are enrolled in a behavioral health home um, and have been um, confirmed by, by Keepro and Main Care and uh, signed to uh, one of your organizations. Um, so with that said, I want to make sure that folks understand that the data is only viewable in, the, in accordance with the same rules that apply to all of your, um, your own organization's mental health or sensitive data coming from another behavioral health organization that may not be on this project. So if the patient has not opted in, the user would have to um, use the more button, as you all have been trained on, to uh, access that information via either a verbal consent that they provided to the user um, or in case of those um, rare emergencies that do occur. Um, so it's the same workflows that exist. So it isn't new, it's really trying to bring all of the sense of mental health data into the same workflow so that that's um, easy and clear for everyone to understand. So in terms of, we just have a few screenshots. The next uh, four slides are really just some screenshots of where this data is, how it works. Um, so just quickly I'll run through that and then if there's any questions, um, you can feel free to enter those in the chat box and we'll get to that in Q&A. Um, so as you all know, when you are looking at patients in, in the Health InfoNet clinical portal, you see on the patient search screen if they have consented in and have opted in on, for mental health data. If so, you would see that date there, and then you would also know that, that um, this new Keepro prior authorization data would then be viewable along with everything else we already have on the patient. For folks um, that are used to this, this is a review, but for folks that may not be um, when a, pa a patient has opted in or given you consent to view their mental health information, what you have is a folder in the document tree on the left-hand column of the portal that says sensitive data displayed. What we now have is a new subfolder to that folder called prior authorization. That is the folder you'll click on to open this Keepro data. Go ahead. Um, once you have selected that information, uh, that folder, what will open in the, in the, on to the right hand side will be a, a, essentially a data table that informs you of which providers that, that they have authorizations for, what are the diagnoses that are um, authorized and connected to that um, particular authorization. And if you hover, just like with some of the other data tables we have in the portal, you get the secondary diagnoses associated with that. In the future, in a future phase, we will also hope to have treatment plans available um, and then the different various services that the member has been um, authorized for. Um, go ahead, next, Gemma. 
um, to the right of that are some other details that may be less important, but we still wanted to bring them forward into the view in terms of the authorization start and date, discharge date, employment status, uh, units authorized, and then the actual authorization number itself. So it, what I do want to make note of, I think folks on the call are also aware of this, but just to reiterate this, what we are doing is we are filtering out any substance abuse related diagnosis information um, or, or coverage treatment um, authorizations for substance abuse information. Um, at this point, the health information exchange still is in a state where we do not accept substance abuse information. So that filtering is being done um, by Keepro and has been tested and validated before we went live with our connection. So I wanted to point that out. You're not going to see that substance abuse information there. Um, so with that said, I think what the current focus is for this initial phase and this kind of pilot, if you will, I think the goal is to, as, as we're complete education, we're still educating our users continuously about this new information. And what, what we're going to be learning is understanding where the, where the value lies, um, what are the uh, areas of the healthcare delivery system that value this information the most so that we can learn about that and use that to continue to expand this information and bring it forward. Um, right now, I think there's a lot of sense in helping primary care and health homes understand that this information is available, helping emergency departments, hospitals um, understand this uh, information is available, certain chronic disease specialists as well. Um, for folks that do not use Keepro, um, they don't have a good sense of what this data is, what it can provide to them, and so we're using it almost in place of what you all are familiar with in terms of what we call our encounter table. So when you look at a patient and you're looking at their patient summary screen, you see their encounter visit table, which shows all of the history of the providers that they're seeing, where they've received care, what the diagnosis is for. So for many um, organizations across the state who cannot share data with us, um, and also our mental health hospitals that are um, getting prior authorization data for, we don't have any other mechanism or way to bring that data forward um, to all of the health infonet users. So I see it as much more than just a traditional administrative prior authorization view. I see it as an encounter view. It's like where are these people receiving services and who are they authorized for so that when they show up to the emergency room and I have the consent in place, then I can know to reach out to that facility that um, uh, mental health hospital provided the service and for what diagnoses, and it really supports that um, time time-sensitive care coordination needs that, that some of our second, sickest folks have in the state of Maine. So um, it's new for us at Health InfoNet, and we're working hard to, to get it out there and get the word out and um, take questions and feedback as, as they come in. Um, so that's really all I have to say, Gemma. I will hand it back over to you for your updates. Oh, well, thank you, Katie. So everyone, we just have just a couple of um, updates for you. Um, the first one, um, very exciting. I've, I've been on the phone with a lot of providers uh, recently talking about Health InfoNet. And one of the things that I have been hearing from especially the nurse care managers mm -hmm. is, oh, we need a form that we can give out for somebody who's changed their mind after they've opted out because now it's important to the client that their information is available because their health issues have changed or because of education by these wonderful providers who meet with these clients who explain to them how important it is to integrate behavioral health and mental health care. They see the light and go, oh, I want my information in. We need a form, they've been saying. Well, I was so excited to find out that, guess what? We now have a form, just what the nurse care managers have been asking for. And it used to be online uh, on our site, but we now have it available to you in paper form. And I will be sending it out to you. It's not for general distribution. It's not for, for you to give to clients when you're giving them your general early consent training. This is for people who have already opted out and have changed their minds. Um, 
I would definitely recommend that providers who have those kinds of conversations, such as the nurse care managers in the behavioral health home environment who tend to have these conversations, or someone like Kara as a substance abuse provider who's talking to people about the benefits of having their medical information available. And if they say, oh, I've changed my mind, how can I make that happen? This is the form that makes it happen. So I will definitely have this available to you um, in a follow-up email. So, um, so that's exciting. Now, I did want to um, spend a little time just really um, giving all of you kudos. Look at what you're doing. This is just SIM year four. Look at what you're doing. From September through April, 28,241 records you've looked up. That's amazing. And I want us to not just glaze over numbers because each of these numbers represents a person. And these, it's someone whose needs you are addressing. I couldn't be more privileged to work with all of you um, just behind the scenes with this. You guys are great. You make a big difference. And so that's just a big, big thank you to all of you. So um, now we're to question period. I have nothing coming through chat. I think Peggy was so clear and concise, and so was Katie. And I didn't have um, anything really complicated, so I don't see any questions here. Um, please know you can follow up with questions. You know where to reach me. Please come to our next webinar on June 20th. And here's my contact information. I want to thank all of you for coming today, and have a wonderful rest of this beautiful day in May. Thank you. Bye.